As you can see, First John, that's going to be the start of a series, at least this week and next week, and we'll see uh, what comes after that um, on First John, the book of First John. And First John is an interesting book. It says a lot of uh, things that I think you'll find interesting. But the problem with John is that his style can be really difficult to understand. Uh, he, he describes things in different ways than the other authors of the Bible do. And, uh, and sometimes it really makes for wonderful prose, like in the beginning was the word and the word was and all that sort of stuff. That's, that's great stuff to hear. Um, but, but sometimes he says things in ways that are really hard to follow. And, and so we'll kind of break it down that way. Uh, First John is actually um, a good place to use a paraphrase because the paraphrase will turn things around a little bit to make them uh, more understandable. And so John will do things like um, that, that we would, for example, um, if you um, got to work and, and discovered that uh, most of the people hadn't gotten to work, they were getting to work later than you, and then an, and an email comes out and, and the email says, um, about half the people today got here late. And for this reason, I'm going to change the work schedule. And okay, so you say for this reason, because you're referring back to what the problem was you described before, but John very often will say for this reason, and he's referring to a reason he's going to give in the future. And sometimes it's two or three verses in the future. And, and so he can be hard to understand because of the way he describes a lot of things like that. And 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 First John really can't be understood without understanding its context. And, and we're going to spend a good bit of time explaining what the context is here. And so First John is speaking to a church. He doesn't say what church it is. It's, it's just some church. But this church has had a problem. Um, it's lost a bunch of its members. Uh, we don't know exactly how many, but it, it, enough that it caused concern among the church members. And, um, and so he's writing to them to, to settle them down and, and to explain to them what happened uh, with these people leaving and why they left. And the reason they left is that some of the members had, had become Gnostics. Now, I've talked about Gnostics before, uh, but I'll, I'll go through that again in, in more detail on a, on a slide coming up. And, and uh, so as Gnostics, they really didn't fit in and it didn't belong there. And they had been teaching Gnosticism to the other members or trying to convince the other members that Gnosticism was the way to go. And, and so John's purpose here is, is to refute all of these things that the, these Gnostics had been teaching in the church and to settle the church down and make, make it clear to them that they're still on the right path and it's the other guys who are on the, on the wrong path. The same author that wrote the Gospel of John? Same author. The same author that wrote Revelation? Uh, that one is disputed a little bit. I, I think it probably is, um, and, and most people say that, but some people say that there, there's another John that it might have been. But, but it's definitely the same one as the Gospel. Yes, and, and you can tell that right away because his style is the same as you see, and I will actually uh, look at that just for a moment here, that his style is the same as, as the Gospel of John. I'm going to do that, just a slide, <laughs> slide just for that purpose. <laughs> And and it, and we'll do that because that's important uh, to all of the things that John is going to say here because he's going to be refuting Gnostic teachings that have been going on in the church. And so this is the slide. Um, so Gnosticism uh, was built on the idea of Greek dualism. I've mentioned that in the past too. And, and the idea of Greek dualism got into the church very early. And it's the reason the church believes that there's a heaven and a hell because Gnosticism believes that everything is either completely good or completely evil. And so when you die, they figured you had to go to either the place that was completely good or the place that was completely evil. And, and so that's where the heaven and, high, and, and hell, I, I, yeah, heaven and hell idea came from. Um, and it doesn't line up with what the Bible says, but it fit into Greek dualism. So, so Greek dualism is kind of the foundation for Gnosticism. And what Gnosticism adds to that is um, the idea of knowledge. Gnosis is Greek word for knowledge. And, and what Gnosticism is, it's the idea that hidden knowledge, secret knowledge, brings salvation. And that's where salvation comes from. It doesn't come from Jesus, it doesn't come from anything else. It comes from having this secret knowledge. And there are Gnostic Gospels that were written. Gnosticism was a really big thing at that time. The uh, Gospel of Thomas, if you've ever heard of that, um, that's a Gnostic gospel, and it teaches this idea that there is secret no knowledge that you can get that will get you into uh, paradise. And and so, did, well. did she? Oh. Yeah, because she would say, um, the Bible doesn't say that we should not eat meat, but I say it because it gave me a special revelation that says we should eat only vegetables and things like the plants. Okay, yeah, special revelations. Yep, uh, definitely a problem there. 
and, and so Gnosticism started in in the church um, as kind of an amalgamation of what the true faith was and and these ideas of hidden knowledge and and good and evil. And, and, but it came in at first. It kind of started in different different forms of it, um, and like a couple hundred years later or so, it kind of merged into a single idea of what the Gnosticism was. And and, and uh, but at, at the time that John is writing this, um, he's kind of fighting against more than one idea of, of what Gnosticism is, even among the Gnostics. And then and, and so it came in different forms. The central teaching was the spirit was entirely good. How do you spell that? Gnosticism, uh, with the G N at the top there. Yeah, it's it's a Greek word, so it isn't spelled up the way we would spell any kind of word. Um, so okay, so the idea is that spirit is entirely good, and matter, anything physical, is entirely evil. And there's that entirely good, entirely evil uh, thing that was part of dualism as well. And so they they saw the human body being matter, and therefore being completely evil. And, and um, no good in it at all. And, and all things physical were, were like that. And they saw God being Holy Spirit and therefore good. And so that gave them a problem with Jesus. If, if Jesus is part God, part man, then they have a real struggle because you've got uh, man they thought was all physical and therefore all evil. And if, if God is, is man, that's a problem. Um, and so they, they struggled with that idea and came up with all sorts of different ideas about who Jesus was because of it. Um, and, and so their idea of salvation was completely different from them. Their idea of salvation was to escape from the body, which was evil. And, and then, then you would, uh, uh, by this special knowledge, be able to escape from the body and, and live a life that was separate from the body. So it, it's not useful to know any of that, but, but it's only useful in this study because um, John is going to be busy refuting a lot of these ideas. And so one of the things that I mentioned there was that uh, they saw Jesus in very different ways uh, than the Bible depicts him. And, and uh, some of the Gnostics said that, uh, that Christ only seemed to have a body. He didn't really have a body. He was something spiritual and, and therefore uh, entirely godly, and, and he wasn't, didn't have a real body. And right from the start, John is going to uh, pick on that one. Um, others said that the divine Christ was something different, too, and he joined Jesus once Jesus was baptized and left him before he died. And, and so they, they made up a number of different ideas to get around the problems that Jesus presented being man and God at the same time. And, and, um, and now the thing that's kind of odd about Gnosticism is because they saw um, everything in terms of, of uh, evil and good and this uh, secret knowledge that brought salvation, they didn't accept anything that we consider uh, moral to be moral to them. And, and so they would do whatever they wanted for morality. And, and it wasn't Christian morality at all. And so breaking God's law was no concern to them because the thing that brought them salvation was this secret knowledge, not, not anything about living a, a, a moral life. And John is going to spend a lot of time on that whole idea of morality, um, law keeping, all of the rest of that. Yep. So I think most people have not heard of Gnostics. We all hear of someone who is an agnostic. So yes. Very, 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 yeah, they, they, they have the same basic word of gnosis and, and yeah. knowledge, but agnostic means something completely different. It's not related at all. It's not related at all to that? Not in any way. Oh, no, wow. no, okay. no. And, and agnostic is a person who says, I don't know if there's a God. Okay. And so that's a different statement from gnosis, which is hidden salvation or hidden knowledge brings salvation. Okay. okay. So, so unrelated, they, their only relation is that they have that same Greek word as their root, uh, but they add on it in different directions. And this was just an influence. This is how the way they, the, the people believe. This was just something from the world that was trying to infiltrate in the church. It, it did infiltrate into the church. Um, yeah, and, and like I said, uh, dualism was a Greek idea generally. Uh, they, they, th they saw their world in terms of things that were all evil or all good and no in between. And, and so that was just kind of Greek culture. That's, that they, that's how they thought about things. And when that idea came into the church, it became this Gnosticism idea because they kind of mixed salvation into it and, and the other things that were biblical, but they came up with a non-biblical Jesus and a non-biblical. 
Yes, yes. The, the, that's what people generally believe. Um, no one has enough history to know for sure. But and, and so the people who do know that this heaven and hell idea came early in the church believe that it came from Greek dualism. The idea that there's uh, <clears throat> that everything comes in two forms. One is entirely good. One is entirely evil. And, and, and so that lines up with the heaven and hell idea, which wasn't really biblical. And, and so they, they figure that it came from dualism, but there isn't anybody who says that we've created these ideas because of dualism. Well, if you look at their culture and their Greek mythology, yeah. there you go. Yeah. It's just, it's really, it's still, a lot of people believe that way, you know, even if they don't believe in God, they say, okay, it's just gonna be there. Like, basically for them, it's a very easy way, you know, like. Yeah. There's no words, there's nothing, you just you know, go, you know, not they you know, it's just it doesn't require for you to to draw close to God or try to Yeah. You know, yeah, that's right. And that, that was Okay, you'll be all right. <laughs> you know, it's almost like when people tell you you do someone, oh this they're seeing you from heaven to there over there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, they've made up a lot of things. Yeah, and and um, in our time, actually, I think I have a slide. Can you saw from here? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, that ancient Gnosticism that was so popular in the churches at, at that time um, has little or no modern adherence. There's really nobody who calls himself a Gnostic anymore, but there are still people who have some remnants of those ideas, and and so. There are people who um, believe that unless you have a seminary education, uh, you aren't qualified to teach the Bible. And, and, and so that's kind of got that Gnosticism idea is that you have to have knowledge to, to be able to be close enough to God idea. And, and so my, my dad actually has that one about me. He's not sure that I should be teaching the Bible because I don't have that seminary education that he has. And, 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 uh, and, and so, um, yeah, so we don't talk about that much. Um, so, um, but, and there are still elements of that secret knowledge idea inside of progressive Christianity. I talked about that a little bit in a church where you've got a bunch of progressives in there, they will have secret things that they believe that are different from the rest of the church. And they won't just tell everybody about that. Once they think that you're ready to be brought into their special group in that church, then they'll bring you in and explain these, these special teachings you're supposed to understand. So there's kind of elements of that Gnosticism uh, still hanging around. But the true Gnosticism of that time doesn't exist anymore. So if, if Gnosticism doesn't really exist anymore, why should we care uh, what John says about it? Well, John is actually going to be teaching some foundational principles here in his refutation of the ideas of Gnosticism. And so those foundational principles are certainly useful to us. And, and what he's going to teach here also does apply to other ideas that we have in our society. There are modern beliefs that de-emphasize morality in favor of something else. And, and, and one, the once saved, always saved and hyper grace ideas are really part of that in that they, they say that once you've been saved, you can't ever lose that. And because of that, um, it's possible for you to become less moral because you, you believe your salvation is firm and you, and you can't ever lose it. And, and so that's similar to Gnosticism in that way that, that you can begin to become a, a less moral person because you're already certain of your salvation. And then so it, 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 for people like that, it does kind of address that. Another group I think that it, it addresses is um, people who are Sunday Christians. They, they live one way on Sunday and the rest of the week, they live in the world. And that's kind of a similar thing as well in, in that um, you have people who are, are not living moral lives except for one day of the week. Now he spends, I'm, I'm, okay, let me just explain a bit about John. John, if John was describing a tree, he would describe every branch of it. He'd describe firstly this entire branch and then this entire branch and this branch and this branch. And finally, you'd know what the whole tree is about. And so we're not going to do it that way. Um, we're going to break it into pieces um, because he, he um, if you group all of the things that he says on a particular topic together, you can pull a lot of good things together. And so the first thing that we're going to uh, focus on is, is uh, the idea of having communion with God. Yeah, I'm not talking about the elements of communion here. I'm talking about um, being together with God. And, and so um, we're going to talk about that uh, because John gets into that communion idea right from the start. So here's John 1.1, 1, 1, 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. 
We evangelize to you that which was from the beginning, that which, that which we have heard and we have seen, that which we have perceived with our eyes and we have touched with our hands, him who is the word of life. Okay, so right away, that sounds like John Gospel. That sounds exactly like it is. Well, I could put the words down here, so similar. In the beginning, the word had been existing and that word had been existing with God and that word was himself God. That's a little different translation than you're used to. Um, but there's that, so that style and right away you can tell, yeah, this is the same John who wrote the Gospel of John. And, and so what he's doing here, uh, you wouldn't understand unless you understood that Gnosticism is what he's gonna be refuting here. And Gnosticism said that the, Jesus wasn't really a physical being. He was really just a spiritual being and people thought he was a physical being. And so he's refuting that idea because he says, we, I, myself, and the other uh, disciples with me, we heard him, we saw him with our own eyes, we touched him with our own hands. And, and so he's making that point. He was real. Uh, he wasn't something uh, non-physical. He was a real physical um, person. And so he's fighting against that Gnostic idea right there from the start. And, and so his history as a disciple and apostle really gives him credibility here. And something that we don't have in our time is we don't have someone who was right there as a student of Jesus and, and can say these kind of things in our time. And I often find myself wishing that there was someone who could do that. But he, uh, he in his time wrote this um, as a person who had known Jesus physically and, and corporeally, and, and he had no doubt about that. And he makes that point here that they touched him with their hands and he was real. And this is the same John the Baptist? Or no, this isn't John. Yeah, John of the Gospel. <laughs> yeah, there are too many Johns around here. <laughs> Yo Yohannan was a popular name. <laughs> And so, yeah, this isn't John the Baptist. This is the John who wrote the Gospel of John. And, and he has uh, three other books, first, second, and third John are all by that by the same thing. And probably Revelation, but there are some people who doubt that. Okay, so uh, so he starts out that way with that idea of, um, I, I saw him myself, he says, and I touched him and he was real. Okay, so now he begins to get into the idea of communion. And, and he says, um, and the thing which we have seen and heard, we show also to you, that you will have communion with us, and our communion is with the Father and with his Son, Yeshua the Messiah. Now, right away, you're kind of seeing the way he organizes the sentences, makes it a little hard to follow. And uh, But what he means here is he's, he's talking about communion in the sense of fellowship, okay? And, and so being um, together in, in a fellowship. Um, and, and, and so he's talking about sharing and caring and people who have a common interest, and that's what the word fellowship means. But fellowship in the Christian meaning is, is deeper than that. It's really talking about a spiritual fellowship. It's, it's us spiritually with uh, fel having fel spiritual fellowship with God, the Son, and, and he includes himself in all of that. And, and so he, he says something here that's kind of interesting. He says, uh, the apostles tell the people what they had seen and heard of the Messiah so that the people will be part of the fellowship that the apostles have with the Father and the Son. So he's saying that we, the apostles, uh, have this fellowship and we want you to be part of that fellowship. And that's why we tell you these things that we know about Jesus and experienced about Jesus uh, so that you will know that, that he was real and that you can have that same fellowship that we have. And now he begins to bring in the Gnostics things and, and, he, and he says, and he starts to talk about darkness here. And his point is that um, com communion does not include the Gnostics and he's going to explain why. And, and uh, so the verses say, and this is the good news that we have heard from him and we evangelize to you. God is light and there is no darkness at all in him. And if we say that we have communion with him and we walk in darkness, we are lying and we are not informed of the truth. So we've, we've heard this before. God is light in the gospel of John for one place. Um, and, he, and so this idea that God is light and doesn't have any darkness in him. And, and so what he uh, says here is if we, walk, if we walk in darkness, now he doesn't mean physically walking, he's talking about that spiritual walk. Um, and, and if we walk in darkness, it isn't possible to have communion with them because that would introduce darkness into God. So God can't have that fellowship with you if you have darkness inside of you. And, and so uh, what he's doing there is he's reminding the people how the Gnostics all walked in, God, in, in darkness. And, and so they, the Gnostics had no interest in, in morality, biblical morality for sure. And, and they lived whatever way they thought it was appropriate because they believed their salvation came from that, that secret knowledge and, and didn't come from anything to do with how you live. And, and John is gonna spend a fair bit of time here talking about how you live matters and, and whether you follow the commandments matters, all these things uh, do matter. 
And so his, his point here is he, does, he doesn't say the main audience, the word Gnostic is a modern name, and, and I don't know what they would have called themselves before if they even had a name. And, and so he doesn't outright say the Gnostics are not in communion, but he, he makes this point about who is in communion. And he says, uh, and by example, people who like like the Gnostics uh, were walking in darkness are not in communion despite their claims and the Gnostics you know in the church would have been saying the same thing we have the same fellowship with God we have the same communion with God as you do but he says look at how they lived the darkness in them shows you that they couldn't possibly have have been telling you the truth in doing that and this reminds me of people and I'm going to think about this last thing you know right now I'm one of the you know he's done it one of the people that this, but those that go to church, particularly in the Catholic Church, they go to church on Sunday, but then on Mondays, they want to see a red shopping. Mm-hmm. They're like, and then they wonder, oh, what's the deal with God? I'm like, <laughs> what's wrong with this picture? Yes, yeah, it's the same idea. If you walk in darkness, why would you expect to have communion with light? It just isn't possible. I was thinking about the first thing it says, uh, about the double-minded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, double-minded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's it. Why you go to the, fall into the doing so just in our makeup? Yeah. Mind. Yeah, and like so many things that Jesus said is you can't be uh, both, you have to be one. Um, and the same idea here. Okay, so he continues on here in this idea of being in communion with the light. And he says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have communion with each other and the blood of Yeshua, his son, purges us from all of our sins. So he says um, that that if you have this communion um, and, and those who walk in the light have this communion, he says, um, then consequently Jesus' atoning sacrifice purges all of our sins from us. And 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 as a result of that that communion that we have, uh, we are purged of, of our sins. Now, John has three ifs in there, and I grouped them together. They're really pretty close, but they're not exactly in, in, a, in sequential verses, but I wanted you to see them. These three ifs are, and if we say that we have communion with him and we walk in darkness, we are lying. And then he says, and if we shall say we do not have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then the third one is, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not with us. Now, that, that, that last one I'm going to bring out a little bit. Um, can you give me a verse from the Bible that, that uh, refutes um, that idea that we have not sinned? So he's saying that if we say that we have, not, that have never sinned, we make him a liar. Who, is, who was telling the lie that, that we're making? That's complicated. <laughs> uh huh. And and what was said? Without yeah, yeah. He was found with no sin. Yeah, yeah. But but for us ourselves, um, um, is there a place in the Bible where it says that we have sin? That that refutes this idea that the Gnostics are saying. Yeah, yeah. Right out there, one of the most common verses that we have. Yeah, there's That's another one. Really yeah. And then so um, the Bible is full of lots of those things that, that talk about that idea. And and so what he says here is, is, if you say you have not sinned, you make God into a liar. You make Jesus into a liar, same sort of thing. And and his word is not with us if we say that. So he's, he's again tackling these ideas from the Gnostics and, and, uh, and showing we're wrong and teaching us some basic ideas also. So uh, continuing on. Um, and, and, he, and so he, he just made the point that, that um, we have sinned in the past and we still can sin. And he says, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and he will purge us from all our evil. And then a little later in chapter two, he, he says something similar. So I brought that in here too. And it says, children, I write these things to you so that you will not sin. And if a person will sin, we have the redeemer of the accursed with the father, Yeshua, the Messiah, the righteous one. And so these together are, again, fighting against the Gnostics' ideas that uh, morality doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the secret knowledge. And, and so he's, he's saying um, um, they, they um, were not in communion with God or else God would have um, purged them of their sins. 
And he says, because you, you know that they weren't purged of their sins, then you know also that they didn't have these things, um, that, that they didn't have the redeemer of the cursed uh, who would take care of these things. And so he, he says, if, if a person sins, Jesus, who is in the presence of the Father, is our redeemer. And, and he, we see that these ideas of forgiveness, purging of sins, and, and redeeming, redeeming meaning being bought back, a price being paid to bring you back into the fold. And, and so all of these things mattered not at all to the, the Gnostics. Uh, they weren't interested in forgiveness or being purged of their sins or being redeemed. Uh, they were just focused on this hidden knowledge idea. Okay, he also spends um, quite a bit of time with commandments. And, and you'll, find this, you'll find this interesting um, because we kind of live in a society now where even in the churches they say, oh, don't be so rigid. Don't, you don't have to follow the commandments like that. But John here is going to make a lot of really good points about the importance of commandments to Christians. And, and the first one here starts in, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And he's, and he's going to make the point that we know him by keeping his commandments, which is kind of an interesting idea. And he says, and by this, and this is one of these things where he's doing a forward reference to, to something you haven't read yet. And by this, we sense that we know him if we keep his commandments. For he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is lying. And, and uh, so he says, if we keep his commandments, we sense that we know him. And so it's by the commandments, by keeping his commandments, we come to have a greater understanding of who he is and how he works. And, and, and so the keeping of the commandments is just something, it's not just something that we have to do or isn't something that we do be, even because we love God and we know that's what he wants us to do. It's something that benefits us. It's something that um, gives us a, a greater understanding of who he is. When we put all this, these things together, we understand. And so this, these living in these commandments, he says, enables us to recognize um, that we are in, are, are in him and are with him. And, and so that gives us... Um, an ability in this case here, especially to recognize false teaching. And, and so because we have followed the commandments and, and know um, how God works, because we kind of see how these commandments all fit together. Well, if somebody brings a false teaching in, we can say, well, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't fit with uh, anything about what I understand. And so that helps us to be wary of false teachings and, and alerted when we see them coming to us. And, and one thing we know for sure is that liberals detest obeying the law. That's just part of their worldview. They don't like people putting laws on them. And, and so liberals um, have a real problem with that idea that we should be obeying the law. And we saw that from NHU a number of times. We won't go there. So, uh, so his point here is, is really, therefore, if we don't keep his commandments, we don't know him. And, and, and so keeping the commandments, as I said, is not just something that we do. Um, is something that helps us to learn more about who God is. Because we justify others, you know, it's about, you know, walking in the light, just like the verse before, it was saying, yeah. walk in the light, have fellowship with him. Yeah, walking in the light is really the same thing as keeping his commandments. Yeah. And and there, there isn't a difference there, just a, really a different way of, of saying it. In the way that people say this is so important that you know, we treat others outside the church mm -hmm. because then you know we live in a bad testimony and then we're still thinking in a wrong image about Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like anything on some of the things that I watch, it says rules for these and not for <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, that's a very elitist point of view. Okay, so continuing on, 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 talks about commandments as well. Now, here I'm jumping through all of uh, 1 John because he talks about commandments through the, diff the five different chapters of this in different places. And, and so I'm going to be jumping on these ex uh, sections that talk about commandments. So this one says, um, but he who keeps his word in this one, truly, the love of God is perfected, for by this we know that we are in him. So this is another one of those, this is, is a forward reference. And so the this he's talking about is verse 6. He who says, I am in him, must walk according to his walk. And so he, he's saying that if, if you understand that, that um, anybody who says, I am in him, must walk according to this walk, then this one is, is truly the loving in God, and God is going to perfect him over time. 
So, so John uh, in the previous verse uh, had been talking about uh, his commandments, and, and now he talks about his word, but it's really the same idea here. Um, and so we know we are in him, he says, because we walk as he walked. And, and so keeping his word is doing that. He, he walked according to the word, um, to the, according to the commandments, and, and he gave us his word about that. And if we walk in the commandments, we are doing the same thing. And, and so we are um, perfected by God through that process of walking the same walk that he walked. And, and earlier on, he had said that if you are in communion, you have no darkness in you. And, and, uh, and so now here he says something that is much the same thing. He says, if you're in the Messiah, you will walk as the Messiah walked. And, and so uh, we have now two different things. He, he talks about the walk and the darkness. And you can say, yeah, they're, they're much the same thing, um, but maybe they're not identical. And this is one of those wonderful places where John can be confusing <laughs> and, and so we'll break it down a little bit um so this is first john 2 7 through 8 and he says beloved ones i am not writing a new commandment to you but an ancient commandment which you had from the beginning but the ancient commandment is that word which you have heard <laughs> and this is where it gets complicated then he says again a new command a new commandment i am writing to you that which is true in him and in you for the darkness has passed and the true light begins to appear and so you read that and he says, I'm not writing you a new commandment. And he says, I am writing you a new commandment. And so mo most people, um, most translators of this um, put that down as um, meaning. Um, but then again, I guess I am sort of writing you a new commandment. So maybe it means it's it's new again to you or, or new to you, or maybe it was newly spoken by Jesus is what he's saying there. There's, there's the people who interpret this uh, and translate this struggle in this area, trying to figure out exactly what he's trying to say. But the, uh, the idea really is, um, I'm not telling you something new. This is, this is an ancient times idea. Uh, it's, this commandment has been around from the beginning. It might be new to you, uh, or maybe it was something that was spoken again by Jesus, but, but this idea existed from before. And, and again, this is another forward reference. We won't see what that commandment is for three or four verses in the future here, but we will see it. Okay. Like, let's go back to the old ways, like that, the scripture says. Yeah, um, yeah, he, he's, he's uh, just trying to conf uh, confirm them, I think, is what he's doing, uh, because they've become unsettled because these, this group of people left their church. And so they're wondering if they are the ones who are, are at fault or whether these other people had the right idea. And so he's, he's really settling them down. He's saying, what I'm telling you here isn't anything new. It's an ancient commandment, and, and you had it from the beginning, um, and, and maybe you're hearing it now new to you. But, but this is an ancient commandment, he says. And we'll see that commandment in just a moment here. So what he, one thing he does here is he uses sunrise as a metaphor. And, and that's quite a common thing for all of the writings in the Bible, is, is they will use nature and things from nature as that. And so he talks about this idea that the darkness has passed and the true light begins to appear. So he's really talking about dawn um, and sunrise as, as being like this. And so he says, um, in us, we started out as, as being darkness from the beginning, but now the time of the darkness has passed and it's possible for the true light to begin to appear in us. And, and so that's kind of a pretty way of describing things. And John does that well. So um, Jesus is the light, he says, that brings light to us that we may walk in his word. And that's not a new idea either. Um, we see the same thing from David uh, in Psalms uh, saying, uh, talking about walking in your light and your word is a light to my path and those sorts of ideas. And, and so it's, it was a very common idea that, that the light of the word or the light of God would be the thing that would allow you to walk in the word. <clears throat> okay, so this ancient commandment he finally gets around to. And, and the ancient commandment we're going to see is to love one another. So uh, the verses are John 1, uh, 1 John, as it say, uh, 3, 10 through 12. By this, the children of God are distinguished from the children of Satan. No one who does not do righteousness, neither loves his brother, is from God. For this is the commandment that you have heard from the first, you shall love one another. So finally here he says, this is the commandment. Not like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Only because his works were evil and those of his brother were righteous. So there's quite a bit in there, but I'm not going to dive into all of it. Um, if you don't live righteously, he says, or you don't love your brother, then you're not from God. 
it's it just isn't possible to be from God and to not live a righteous life and to not love your brother. Those just don't mix together. Uh, and so um, he, he says um, this commandment is an ancient commandment, but it, can you tell me where in the Old Testament it says um, love one another? It doesn't really say that in, in there. And and so what he's, he's saying here is not so much that it was a literal commandment, but that it was um, understood uh, if you understood what the Bible was saying. And And so starting from that he's going to go ahead here in the next few verses and explain exactly how it happens that love one another was an ancient commandment i hope that'll make some sense here it's kind of like um the, the sabbath even though there was no command for it the adam and eve seemed to understand it and people before those talents were actually uh you know dispersed by moses they existed in some way because they were implied yeah or they just naturally understood but he just put it you know on on top you know to make it permanent i guess yeah yeah lots of people talk about that it, it would have been nice if we understood why they understood this stuff um yeah. but we don't but it is true <laughs> you see lots of evidence of that, that that the people before moses had an understanding of the law you know, I was thinking about the verse to say Jeremiah 6 16, when he said the old commandment, it says, This is what the Lord says, stand at the cross, crossroads and do ask for the ancient facts. You know, and this is something else. For the ancient facts, ask for the good way it is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Yeah. yeah, the ancient paths. Mm -hmm. Like it was just something already established Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so uh, still uh, John is talking about uh, keeping commandments, and so we're going to go through uh, more verses still about that. Um, okay, this is from First John 3 uh, still, and he says, And we shall receive all the things that we ask from him, because we keep God's commandments and we do good before him. Now that's an interesting idea all, all by itself um, is that um, there are many other places in the Bible that, that says um, it, what you ask from, from God, he will give, or it says he will give according to his will. Um, but here it says um, he will give it to us because we keep God's commandments. And so that's really showing us uh, God, uh, John's uh, view that uh, keeping the commandments is critical to that relationship that we have with God that he would ever give us um, those things that we ask from him. And so continuing on with the reading, and, and this is, is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Yeshua the Messiah, and we should love one another as he commanded us. And whoever keeps his commandments is kept by him, and he dwells in him. And by this we perceive that he lodges in us from his spirit, that one, that one whom he has given us. Really hard sentence, uh, that last one. In fact, this, this whole set of things I'm going to be breaking down more next week um, because parts of it relate to different topics. Uh, but in any case, what, he, what he's saying there is um, uh, that that commandment that we have from God is that, is that we should believe in the name of his son. And we talked about in the name doesn't mean uh, Jesus or Yeshua. It means in the character or according to his will is, is maybe a better way to say it. And and so so we believe in the name of his son. Uh, and uh, And also we should love one another as he commanded us. And, and then he says, and whoever keeps his commandments is kept by him. And, and so um, if you are a person who keeps God's commandments, then God keeps you. And there's been a lot of discussion about what is exactly meant here by kept. In fact, some translations um, say remains in him instead of kept. Uh, and and uh, but I think we'll touch on that one next week. And and um, and this multi-clause sentence that, that follows is really complicated to understand. Um, and, but what he's really saying there is that uh, if you keep his commandments and, and you are kept by him and um, God dwells in you because of that. And, and we, we understand that God dwells in us from his spirit and, and because we perceive that um, the spirit lives in us. Um, and then you really would need to add another sentence that would say, and this is the spirit that was given to us. So it's a complicated sentence for sure. Um, and John loves those. Um, and, but the idea is, is really 
the, the necessity of keeping his commandments is, is something that is really part of our relationship with God. It is that uh, we keep his commandments, uh, not just because we're told to, but because it's relational with him. Okay, um, continuing on. And we have received this commandment from him. Everyone who loves God shall love his brother also. So uh, John is, is combining the two greatest commandments. You remember what they were. They were love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so he's really putting these two together. And he says, everyone who loves God shall love his brother also. And he's going to keep filling in this idea here. And so he's saying, um, and when he's talking about brother here, he's not talking about neighbor, as we sometimes see in, in the New Testament. He's talking about uh, brothers in the faith. It, that seems to be almost certain here. That doesn't mean that we aren't supposed to also um, love those who are not our brothers, but he's talking about that relationship we should have with brothers in the faith here. And so uh, John says that loving God and your brother are inseparable ideas. You, you can't love God and not love your brother. And he's saying this because of the Gnostics. The Gnostics didn't love them um, and they disagreed with uh, the people, other people in the church. And, and the other people in the church knew that there was that separation between them. And he's saying uh, here that uh, if you love God as the Gnostics claim, then you, you would have loved your brothers as well, but they didn't love their brothers. And they, and they left the church too. With the Catholic Church, do you now before the, the start of persecuting others and trying to kill them because they didn't that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, before they started killing other Christians. I yeah, in the Protestant Reformation. Um, I, I think I mentioned that a little bit last week. I'll just do a quick thing on that here. Um, the Protestant Reformation uh, started out with the, um, a few people realizing the Catholic Church had gone a long ways off track. And um, they began to uh, teach against the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church didn't appreciate that at all. And they had the power to kill people. And they exercised that power. And so some of the earliest... Um, people who translated the Bible into the people's own languages were, were executed. And, and then later on, after the Protestant Reformation had caused a, a, about a 50-50 split in the Roman Catholic Church, um, they, it turned into wars between the people. And, and you would have the Protestants who lived in one area of a city killing the Catholics who lived in the other area of the city and the Catholics killing them back. And, and so things got really ugly for um, like 100 years or something like that. And, and, and uh, yeah, you'd think that this idea of your brother um, would, would have been something to inform them there, but it didn't. This often turns into troubles. <clears throat> troubles, yeah, but not, not open killing and anything like that. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That happened even when my sister said they went to the museum and they saw the just for the Mexico where the church or people, you know, they just, that was horrible. And I can imagine, you know, also think about the Jews, how they were persecuted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something, <laughs> going way off track here. <laughs> um, there was a period of time when um, the Catholics lost control of Rome and lost control of the Vatican. And people got a chance to go in there and see some of the things that were in there. And they had torture chambers and torture devices of all sorts for, for torturing people. And that was just... They thought that was a perfectly appropriate thing to have in the Vatican. Um, and, and one of those was um, um, a deep stone walled pit that had sharpened stakes that stuck into it. And so if you were thrown down this pit, it would, you would be ripped together, uh, ripped into pieces as you fell towards the bottom of it. And, and so they had wonderful things like that. And, and there was a period in time when the Catholic Church actually asked themselves, is this how we should be doing things? Is this really appropriate for a church to be doing that? And in the end, they decided that, yes, it was appropriate because, <laughs> because you were saving these people from committing more sins that they would have to uh, atone for or have to suffer for. <laughs> <laughs> but you would think they would just put them to sleep or something in that in a humane way, but no, just for all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so anyway, that was way off topic. So um, yeah. Uh, so um, John John says that loving God and your brother are inseparable things. You, you can't love God without loving your brother. It just isn't possible. And and as I said, he's talking about your brothers in the faith here. And and so 
And he's going to explain more about this on, on the next slide. Um, and we're kind of filling in that idea of how it is that we should, um, how it is that loving your brother was actually um, an ancient commandment. And so here's where he really gets to, to explaining how um, the idea of loving one another was an ancient commandment. And, and this is from 1 John 5. So we're now at the last chapter of, of John. And he says, everyone who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah is born from God. And everyone who loves him who begot, gave birth to, loves also the one who is begotten of him. That's speaking of Jesus. And by this, we know that we love the children of God whenever we love God and we do his commandments. Yes, this is hard to read, but we'll work our way through it. For this is the love of God to keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So from the first, we see again, this idea of commandments being important to the relationship that we have with God. But, but what we see particularly at the start here is this idea that um, if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Messiah, um, then you are born from God. It was like you were you were born again from God. It's really what he's saying. And he says, everyone who loves him who begot, so loves God who begot Jesus, uh, loves also the one who is begotten of him. So you, if you love God, then you must love Jesus. That's an inseparable idea he's saying as well. And you, you, it wouldn't be possible, he says, to love God and to not love Jesus. And and so continuing on, um, he says that that because all of the other people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah are also born from God and therefore children of God, then we love the children of God in the same way that we love Jesus, because we are all from God. We are all the children of God. So uh, rehashing that again, he says that, that if you love God, then you must love Jesus because Jesus is his, is his child that he begot. And, and uh, therefore, you must also love all of the other children of God who are your brothers. I hope that makes some sense. And, and so, um, so he says, for, for this is the love of God to keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, some people say, oh, no, those commandments are way too burdensome. I couldn't possibly keep the Sabbath. That's way too much work. Um, and, and, uh, and so some people uh, don't like the commandments because they see them as burdensome, but that's really their own internal problem. The commandments themselves are not that burdensome. I think it's just a Sabbath that they have a problem with me. I mean, you can't say, no, I have to steal, or, <laughs> or I have to commit adultery, or I have to do this and that. It's more, it has to do with the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. That those stumbling blocks for them. Yes, but you can also look at it as, um, the way you look at your brothers, um, you can say evil things about your brothers and say it was necessary for me to say evil things to get him back on the right track. Uh, and, and that's not the right way to do it. But yeah, generally, yeah, you couldn't um, say I need to commit adultery. Um, so um, continuing on, he says, in, the, in this way, we love all the children of God. And, and so loving God includes all of his children um, and, and along with Jesus. And, and finishing up, he says, we show that we love God by keeping his commandments. So summarizing all of this, and we've only scratched the surface, surface on. First of all, he talks about inconsistencies here, and this is towards the idea of, of the Gnostics. Uh, he's been going through all of this, pointing out inconsistencies between what the Gnostics have been saying and how they've been living. And so they've been saying that they are in communion with God. They've been saying that, that they have this relationship with God, but they don't live like that, he says. They, they don't live according to the commandments. They don't live according to what Jesus said. And, and so this inconsistency, he says, is not possible. They, they can't be in communion with God if they are living the kind of lives that they're living. And, and he says over and over here, if you claim something, then it's inconsistent to do this other thing. So he says, if you claim to be um, in communion with God, then you can't be doing things that are, are darkness in you and and so he says if you are in communion then then how can there be any darkness in you and that kind of goes back to the start saying that it's not possible that if you have darkness in you and and remember also that he talked about um forgiveness and so if there had been darkness in us it would be forgiven if we were in communion with god and we wouldn't have that dark darkness in the communion but as it was they weren't expecting any forgiveness or anything like that for what they were doing they saw it as completely acceptable to live um, immoral lives. But they also believed that they were in communion with God. So inconsistencies between what the Gnostics were saying and how they were living is, is a big part of what 
has been the focus on in these sections we've looked at so far. As I said, Gnosticism was a big problem at that time. Um, there were, it was a, a really hard on the churches. A lot of people were, were falling into that idea and um, they believed wrong. And because of that, they lived wrong. And as I mentioned at the start here, there are other kinds of beliefs that, that are part of the church that can encourage that sort of behavior. And, and the one I've talked about most was the once saved, always saved idea. If you, if you believe that idea that you can't lose your salvation, then that kind of opens the door for you to live a, a less moral life than you should be living and, and think that you're doing just fine because you couldn't possibly lose your salvation. And, and the Gnostics, for the same re reason, believed that they couldn't lose their salvation because they had this hidden knowledge and, and therefore it wasn't important how they, whether they lived a moral life or not. So John says a number of things through here, and I'm just summarizing a few of his points. He said Jesus was real. We saw that right at the start. He says, Jesus, um, John says, Jesus, I saw him with my eyes. I heard him and I touched him with my hands and I know he was real. And, and the, the Gnostics didn't agree with that, as we mentioned. Uh, the Gnostics were full of darkness, he says. Uh, therefore, they were not in communion, despite what they might have said, the, the opposite of that. And he says that, that we also were in sin, but we've been pur purified by Jesus' blood. And so we are in communion. And, and because we are in communion now, if we sin, we are forgiven and the darkness is gone and we remain in communion. Um, we'll go into more of that uh, in detail next week as well, I expect. Um, the Gnostics did not keep the commandments and he makes that point over uh, and over again, the importance of keeping commandments. And, and that points out that the Gnostics weren't keeping the commandments. And the Gnostics also did not love their brothers. And so he spends a lot of time talking about what our relationship should be with our spiritual brothers in the church. Sounds like they were snobs. They would have seemed like that. Yeah. They probably did think that they were better than other people. Yeah. Yeah. Elitist view. Yeah. We have this secret knowledge that makes us better than you. Easy to imagine they believe that. 